Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout taylor Our guest today is Zach Davis. He is a senior fellow at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory and a research professor at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Zach, I'm so excited to have you on the podcast to talk about something that we actually haven't covered much on this podcast to date. And it's sort of, I would say, the dark side of innovation, <laughs> uh, if you like that, that way of phrasing it. But, you know, I think there's, there's sort of an abounding and popular narrative here in the U.S. And, and maybe even globally that innovation and progress and technological advancement is always good. And you know, the culture in Silicon Valley sort of exacerbates this or amplifies it. We say move fast and break things. But your leadership is actually and really importantly in the opposite line of thinking, which is what are the threats? What are the risks that, um, that are impactful to our national security or to our companies or to our livelihoods when certain risks and, and, um, and outcomes of innovation don't go the, the way that were planned or actually, when they're actually invented for the sake of of being harmful. So tell us more about your work. I find this to be incredibly fascinating, and I'm I'm really excited to dive in. Well, thanks, Katie. Uh, Yeah, technology is always a double-edged sword. And uh, it always has, you know, a dual-use nature to it. And in fact, as you mentioned, you know, in in the defense uh, industry and in the United States government, you know, we're specifically looking for innovation that can be applied towards what you might call the dark side. Uh, that's that's our our goal, and uh, and there's a long history of of, of this. In fact, uh, it's technology seems to always reflect human nature more than more than anything else. I'm reminded of, of that first opening scene in uh, 2001, A Space Odyssey, where, where the apes uh, are, are in front of the monolith, and it takes them about one minute when they pick up that bone <laughs> to, to start banging it <laughs> on the, on the uh, bones and looking around to see who they can hit with it. So... <laughs> You know, th- th- this really is something inherent in human nature, and and the technology really just is an expression of human nature, um, and and with all of its you know, with all of its flaws and and uh, itself having a dark side and a light side, right? Yeah. What led you to be interested in this this line of research and this line of leadership? Yeah, I, well, I started off, I mean, when I finally got around to going to college, which didn't come early or naturally to me, but when I did, I, I, I thought, you know, I wanted to go into the science. I was really interested in, in science and, uh, and physics and, you know, being a surfer, I, I wanted to study oceanography and I thought that would be a good way to combine, you know, my interests. And so when I started going to school and going to those classes and it didn't take me long to realize that I was a lot more interested in the effects of technology, of the political consequences, of the decision making, of, of, of the outcomes of technology than the technology itself. Um, and, and so it led me to start trying to look at you know, science policy and technology policy and, and the decision making that went around that and that of course pretty quickly leads you to nuclear weapons and uh you know consequential or strategic uh technologies uh, that sort of have that capacity to change the world um and 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 take it off what you might think of as a sort of steady progress um, and take the world off into different directions. And so I, I got interested in nuclear weapons and nuclear strategy and nuclear policy and nuclear history and you know how those technologies started off and came to be and how they 
evolved into, you know, I mean, nuclear weapons and nuclear technology is a good example of what I was saying about dual use, right? Uh, it, it, it can be a wonderful source of, of energy and, and is applied to, to medicine and, you know, is a real benefit to mankind and humanity, but is also, uh, it carries inherent within it this ability to, to destroy uh, everything that's been built and created. Uh, and, and so it's, you know, sort of the quintessential strategic latency type of technology. Yes. Yeah, so you, you, you've written a lot about strategic latency for people, for listeners who maybe aren't as familiar with the term, could you help define it for a lay person? Yeah. So, you know, it, it goes by a lot of names and different, uh, you know, different uh, institutions, different researchers have different words for uh, emerging technology, emerging and disruptive technology. Uh, we hit on the, the term strategic latency for a couple of reasons. One is um, we use this very overused word strategic, right? Um, so what what is strategic? And what it means for us is that this is something that is especially consequential, not just every technology, uh, but we want to distinguish out those technologies that have that world changing, you know, something that can shift the balance of power, something mm-hmm. that that would uh, could not be ignored, you know, uh, and that was uh, era defining and and world power distribution defining. And so that that kind of winnows down your list. Of course, there's you know still a debate about which technologies belong in that category or not. And there are a number that are now you know sort of candidates for that capability. But nuclear weapons, of course, you know are, are sort of the poster child for for that kind of strategic capability that is inherent in the technology. Uh, the second word, latency, which is another amorphous term and means different things to different people. But latent for us refers to that that underlying and sometimes yet unexploited, unappreciated uh, uh, aspect of the technology, because quite often these technologies don't have the, you know, obvious uh, application that now all, you know, it all in retrospect seems clear to us that these things had this latent potential to be used in these ways. But oftentimes these technologies lay sort of dormant until they meet up with other technologies or uh, that's where we get into the realm of, of innovation, right? Someone comes up with an idea like, well, you know, we could, and then, you know, there's a chain of events uh, that, that brings that latency to the fore. And it, then it can be exploited either for commercial or military or creative purposes. And so there is a lot of latency around in the technologies. You know, the, there, there are lists and lists of, of technologies that, that could be uh, exploited in different ways. And, you know, today, you know, we, we, we have... You know the the whole biotech field is is just really uh, you know with genetic engineering uh, you know going off with latent potential uh, and then there's you know in the, the quantum computing um, you know hypersonics the the space is another area where there's you know tremendous explosion of latent technologies that have this potential they could be on the list. But yet we don't know. And maybe, you know, 20 years ago, people were talking about, um, you know, cyber and the Internet. And, you know, this has tremendous potential to change the world. Um, and, and it wasn't clear how that was, was going to unfold with iPhones and, and the like. And it has. And, and so these things are hard to predict. And they are latent until, you know, the, the human motivation puts that intent behind it and starts to 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 innovate and, and create new applications. So by definition then strategic latency, there's some element of time involved 
and, and sort of doing research on this. So a lot of innovation teams are focused on futuring or trying to predict future trends, especially in consumer behavior or that sort of thing. What is, in your mind, the relationship between strategic latency research and the work of futuring that happens inside of innovation? Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a really interesting topic area because, because people are in love with prediction. Right. Then and, and people they want it. And they want to know the future. Um, and they, they want, want to be to the one who got it right. <laughs> they they do. They want to cash in on it or they want to write science fiction, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, they wanna they want to see the future. And uh and, and and there's a you know a great Jules Verne and you know H. G. Wells and uh Isaac Asimov and you know they all <laughs> had great ideas about the technology of the future. Um, and today we, we have, you know, kind of a cottage industry of, of people trying to predict, but I think more, more specific to the defense application world, uh, you know, there's, there's a question of, of strategic warning, right? What's coming? Um, what, you know, if they could do this, could they do that? And so there's a, a focus on what, you know, other innovators, other countries, other companies, you know, other groups, other competitors are doing. And, you know, what if? Well, you know, what if they were able to put this with that? And, uh, you know, the, so predicting uh, also is, <laughs> sorry to say, hard. And... Uh, <laughs> And, and and there's there's a, a sort of a sort of a unicorn that we're chasing in prediction that maybe with enough data, right? Maybe with, with big enough computers and enough data um, and and the right algorithms, you know, we could come up with a prediction as to how these technologies are going to join up with with human motivations and produce something we haven't seen before. And, you know, is that going to be, you know, dangerous? And is that going to be applied to military purposes? And so, you know, prediction in, in the U.S. government really is the, the realm of the intelligence community, where you're looking at, you know, what's coming and do we need to warn people about it? But it's also in the realm of, of defense planning, right? Because you're building today uh, or you're planning today for things that won't come into existence uh, for, you know, sometimes quite, you know, years and years. It takes a long time to build a big, you know, naval or space system. And so, you know, you want to know what the battlefield looks like now so that you can prepare for it. But of course you can't. <laughs> so there's a, it, it's it's a it's a robust industry these days. This notion of foresight and predicting um, what what's coming and, and how it's going to manifest. And of course, in the private sector, that 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 is business intelligence, right? That's you know, what exactly. are the competitors going to be doing? You know? Yes. Well, it, there's there's an additional irony and tension here between the motivations of the business world and and innovators and the government's role in national security. There's a, a really a clash here in terms of how we think about innovation. The innovator is using data and prediction to anticipate what might be uh, profitable and to understand changing behaviors that might lead to a need for certain new technologies without necessarily having to think about the consequences of that to the national security. And then on the other hand, you have national security with and defense and and um, and national leadership and government needing to have that as their major priority is safety, um, while also still contributing to economic growth. So these things are in such tension. It seems to me that um, they really speak different languages. Well, you're 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 so right about that, and it it used to be, I mean, at least you know, in, in during, during the Cold War, uh, that. Many of the big technology innovations originated in the government, right? They were 
the result of big government programs, you know, the Manhattan Project, or, yes, you know, stealth or, you know, the iPhone and, you know, and, and so these government agencies and government projects were, were, were the, the birthplace of a lot of these world changing technologies. And that meant for a time, the government could control those things, right? You could have export controls and you could have secrecy and you could say, you know, not everyone is allowed to know about this um, and you could control it, right? That was a way to control the broader effects of, of the technology. But of course, everything is spun off and the government is really no longer the, the you know, the, the sole source of these kinds of big technological innovations and it's really all um in the in the private sector and it, and that's where the silicon valley comes into the picture and of course you know there it is a different culture uh, but they have fundamentally different goals uh than the government as you said you know the government's main purpose is to protect the people in the nation and the uh the the, the companies are primarily focused on making money and, you know, shareholder value. And so th there's a really big gap, right? And, and there's a gap between the cultures. And you say, I mean, the language uh, that, that, that people use is, you know, it's, it's hard to even talk across uh, that, that gulf um, of, of government speak and defense speak and intel speak and Silicon Valley entrepreneurial, you know, uh, uh, culture that has grown up, um, you know, with its own language and its own way of, of doing things. But interestingly, you know, the government, like I was saying, you know, wanting the best newest technology, wanting to understand the battlefield of the future and prepare for it is, is uh, at least understands that they need the private sector now. And interestingly, you know, the private sector is global, right? These Silicon Valley firms are global. They are mm -hmm. not U.S. firms in, in many ways. They're, they're fully globalized and they have global customer base mm -hmm. and their talent base is global, right? They get people and experts, um, you know, from, from the world. And so you've got a situation where these, you know, formerly secretive uh, defense uh, industrial complex managers are forced to reach out to the the, the primary source of innovation um, and and try to bridge that gap. And so there have been a number of, uh, of of efforts put in place specifically to do that. So there's something in Silicon Valley here called the Defense Innovation Unit was created uh, in the last administration specifically to, to build a bridge and, and get to know, and uh, as, as they put it when it was established, be a kind of a, you know, a consulate, be a kind of an embassy for the Defense Department in Silicon Valley and reach out and, and understand, you know, their, their needs. Uh, the, the terminology and the metaphor alone speaks to this the the seriousness of the divide that it is a consulate as if we were sort of entering into foreign territory and having to speak a totally different language it's true um and and so you know you saw a couple of real tense moments uh in that uh in in particular you know, with artificial intelligence, with AI, and the Defense Department realizing that they can't live without that, that, you know, the future battlefield will be um, very heavily dependent on these tools for a variety of purposes. Um, and uh, that, that, you know, there, there was no recourse. They had to go to Silicon Valley. Uh, the, uh, the 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 CIA already had an outpost and has an outpost in Silicon Valley called Incutel, and their business model was to look at the technologies that could be applied to their needs, to intelligence needs, 
and then make sure that those companies didn't die, right? So they were in the role of kind of a, a venture capital investment um, uh, entity that would, you know, make sure that these companies that were struggling that had something that were really onto something that, that the government could use didn't just, you know, die in what they call the valley of death, Mm -hmm. you know, between a great idea and a first round of funding, but we just couldn't make it work. We just couldn't find the customer base. So we had to close it up. So that model has been successful. Um, the, the, the defense innovation unit model is a little bit different. Um, but they also are looking at startups and they're looking at ways to build these partnerships and bring, uh, the, uh, Silicon Valley class um, into the inner circle of what their defense needs really are, right? Mm-hmm. And with with AI, that all kind of focused on something called Project Maven, in which Google was helping because they are a leader in 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 this field, and uh, and Google was helping the Defense Department. Um, and, and mainly in uh, the massive flows of data, right? I mean, that, that's really the battlefield of the future are these massive flows of data coming from multiple sources because it's a multi-domain battlefield is what we call it now where, you know, you've got the space assets and, and ground and unmanned uh, uh, vehicles of various types, massive data flows coming in. And so Project Maven was, you know, helping with that. And you saw uh, kind of a rebellion uh, amongst uh, some of the the Google staff to help kill people. I'm not doing that. Um, And so it was maybe a instructive experience for both sides and, and, and more people in the Silicon Valley side are coming to understand, you know, the, the totality of what defense means and the defense side, and, uh, you know, people are coming more to understand, uh, you know, the priorities and ethics of, uh, of the private sector. I'd love for you to keep uh, sharing a little bit more about that. You've written about key insights from leading experts on the threats, opportunities, and the national security challenges posed by emerging and disruptive technologies. And you've already offered some powerful examples, but could you share some more stories coming out of this particular area? Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of what's interesting about this whole topic, right, is, uh, uh, you know, it, it is so expansive, right? It, it cuts across every, every stovepipe and, you know, every culture and every country. So I guess the way to think about it um, is on the human side, you know, what are people doing, right? What are some of the innovative technologies that are being developed, um, you know, not in places that we know, but in, in other countries. And of course, there's a lot of attention being paid these days uh, to China, because they are clearly making the investments. They are putting their money where their mouth is, and they're pouring resources, and by that I mean human resources, but, you know, monetary resources, they're putting a lot of effort into these key technology areas. And that includes the the biotech field, but uh, computing power, uh, you know, neurology, uh, it's just across the board. And uh, they're putting the pieces together and they're getting their people you know, trained in the the best uh, universities around the world, and uh, they've clearly made it a a, a goal to to be a a leader in, in a number of these key technologies, and that has people concerned. 
um, you know, because of the military applications. And one of the interesting aspects of this, you know, global competition is that, you know, these country cultures are also, you know, evident in, in the competition. So you look at Russia and it's a whole different thing. And this question of the private sector becomes really important. Uh, whereas, you know, China has unleashed um, these companies, although uh, with a tether, and you saw this in the TikTok, TikTok and WeChat concerns, is that some of their technologies, you know, may actually still have a link to the government. And so that raises the, well, why, why, you know, what are they doing with this data? Is this going to be weaponized? In Russia, you just don't have the private sector. And that's really hurt them. And it's made it very hard for them to compete in certain areas. Now, of course, they have world-class brain power, but they just don't have the, the, the financial resources or the entrepreneurial class. And they lose uh, those people to the West where they go off to make money, <laughs> right? Uh, and so, you know, Russia's going to be going to be hurt by this. And so I guess one of the most interesting aspects of this is the, the cultural dimension that as globalized as everything is and as uh, globally available as all this technology is um, in the defense world, um, it still comes down to countries and how different, you know, countries make decisions and have a good relationship with with these companies and um, are, are able to to rely on them and 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 you know uh, have a mutually beneficial relationship or or whether you know you have uh, you have to go outside of your own country mm -hmm. and pay the, the the price for for global technology um, so it, it's it, it, it's interesting, um, and of course the other way you can categorize it is by technologies, right? And a lot of these fields are are culturally different, right? So the biotech industry is really different uh, from uh, you know the biological sciences operate by different set of scientific norms and principles, and you know you you go through a different training in order to be credible and 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 uh, productive in that field uh so you get into a lot of other uh sort of disciplinary or multidisciplinary uh controversies as well right the ethics the norms you know and even treaty right we're in a post theranos world and um right. some of the sort of blind f forward momentum without enough to be frank medical rigor or scientific review i think that the culture in that space is starting to change and validation is more critical um but there's still even just last year there was a great um research study published about the the lack of peer reviewed studies around healthcare unicorns right. and i'll i'll link it in the show notes cuz it's a great read um but i think the culture is starting to change, but it's a slow change. And, um, but again, that that's really critical, not just to, not so much to the national security interest in terms of the, the, the validity of the medical products that, that we're putting out there for the world. Well, I, you know, that's one of the interesting aspects of this is, is the, the, you know, the moral questions that come up, um, which, you know, to some extent are, are embedded in in treaties and practices and and ways in which the scientific community has operated, but especially you know in in, in the you look at the biosciences, you know there were expectations that certain things ought not to be done, <laughs> that you know we we shouldn't do certain things, and and a lot of those barriers have been tested and kind of bypassed. And so that's an interesting question, uh, you know, in in the defense and and diplomacy world, a lot of those norms of behavior about things that you know should not be done are embodied in treaties. 
All right. So, so there's the biological weapons treaty, the chemical weapons treaty, the nuclear nonproliferation treaty, the treaty uh, against testing nuclear weapons, and testing in the atmosphere, and you know things that that humanity uh, had decided were probably better better left undone <laughs> for for the benefit of all. And I think it's it's fair to ask. That if if these norms and practices and institutions and laws and agreements um, are being uh, tested and and uh, and and proven uh, to be unenforceable and proven to to, to be um, when you know when push comes to shove um, no longer. Uh, no longer being practiced and no longer being respected. So you see things like chemical weapons, uh, you know, coming back. And that was something that people thought, you know, had been dealt with that you know, chemical weapons convention, you know, the uh, OP, you know, the, there's an in enforcement and, and, and verification agency. But when, you know, when these international multilateral institutions um, are reliant on great powers to enforce these ideas, uh, you know, it comes down to great power politics. And right now, great power politics are, <laughs> are, are, are not putting multilateral agreements um, uh, ahead of, uh, of, 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 Perhaps what of, might of feel like short term. Design. Right, right. Yeah. I was going to say in terms of it, putting that ahead of perhaps what might actually be short term personal gain or interesting. Right. Yeah. There's a, could you speak a little bit to, I, I know your areas of expertise are weapons of mass destruction um, and some more sort of physical threats, but um, we are also living in an age of disinformation and data being used um, to influence and change public opinion or the, the mindsets of, of people. Um, is that an area that you touch on in some of your research as well? Well, I'm, you know, I, I'm one of these, you know, uh, drifters who I, I <laughs> I'm a jack of all trades and a, and, a, and a master of none, but it allows me to uh, go and get the right people to answer those kinds of questions. And the new book that, that we have done for the um, Special Operations Command uh, has a huge section on that question of, of disinformation. And, and of course, you know, the, the obvious, uh, you know, current examples of, of how easy it is and the globalization of the information flow has just, you know, democratized disruption, right? Yes. It's, it's too easy. Uh, and and you don't have to really have a lot of resources. Uh, it's not like discovering a new element or fielding a new weapon system. This has really opened up the field uh, because it's just so easy. And you know how I started off talking about these tools being really merely a reflection of human nature. And I think that's what you see in the disinformation side, um, which is, you know, these these flaws, these deficiencies, I mean, it's, it's right through, throughout political philosophy, it's in the Bible, it's, it's, it's in all of our understanding of, of human nature that, you know, we have these fears and insecurities and, and prejudices and confirmation bias, and that's just a part of being human. And so these tools, these global tools that can get into your pocket, that can reach billions in a in a in a nanosecond uh, have opened up this new realm of influence of influence operations and again you know no no norms to guide this no uh, sense of restraint and uh, it we have hurtled forward in discovering the latent potential of these technologies and the influence on you know on individual group collective uh consciousness 
And of course, that has tremendous implications for democracy, but also for leadership. You know, when the, you know you can undermine decision making by introducing controversial ideas that are not, you know, supportive of of uh, of, of of leadership directions or leadership, you know, uh, uh, priorities, and and it's just too easy, and and and. We seem to be globally willing uh, to, you know, to to let this tsunami um, overwhelm us. And what comes on the other side when you know <laughs> there's no ability to to distinguish between um, truth and lies or uh, interpretations? And you know, it comes down to critical thought, right? I mean. Mm-hmm. I asked my kids about this too, because they, you know, they're on this, all this social media platforms that I'm not, and I don't understand. And they say, Hey, you know, dad, did you, did you hear about this? I go, well, that sounds like that is stupid. That can't be right. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, well, you know, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, this new generation is at at least um, extremely cynical. I find, <laughs> and that may be our saving grace, right? They don't believe, they know it's all BS. They don't believe anybody. They don't believe me. They don't believe you. They don't believe it. They at least, I mean, it, it's it's a little disheartening because, because you don't want to raise a, a generation of cynics. On the other hand, they at least have this critical capacity to know that all this stuff that's flowing into their phones and computers and across the, you know, the, the, the universe may or may not be true. Mm-hmm. The problem is they don't believe anybody. Right. So- right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, and I think we're just now, after all these years living in a world um, that is so dominated by social media, we're just now seeing some of those companies start to block misinformation or take more proactive measures. And that is a problem, but at least we're getting in that direction now where it's, it's taken a long time. Um, but they're starting to, it seems as though the innovation community perhaps thanks to some pushback from national security and and government leaders starting to be more prepared to uh, defend and and protect against the widespread rapid fire dissemination of incorrect information. Well, I think that that there's a a new global competition for soft power. Um, And all of these you know, all this connectivity and the mechanisms that, that enable it um, are opening new possibilities, you know, for, for influence and, and for global power, right? And where we used to talk about soft power, you know, in a, as, as being somewhat secondary to hard power being military, you know, economic, real tangible forms of power, and soft power being you know, cultural and and conceptual and, you know, other forms of influence that come from global connectivity. And I think in particular, you know, you know that, that you notice that Chinese entities have now uh, purchased most of the big Hollywood movie studios and are exercising influence over content. Um, and so uh, one of these words that I, I hate, but I have to use, um, is that there's a, a, a global competition for narrative, right? Who's telling the story? And I mean, I guess that, that that's just right in your wheelhouse, Katie. Right, right. Because uh, it's all about the story and who tells the story and how you tell the story. And the United States, you know, during its time of, you know, preponderance, uh, throughout the Cold War, really had that primary, you know, that position of of, uh, uh, of being able to tell the story, you know, and and control the narrative. And so it was American movies and American authors and American TV and American products, 
you know, so Batman and Levi's and John Wayne, and we built a, a narrative of, of, of America and the American century. And I think that in the, the contest for, you know, global power now, uh, there's a, that's all being contested. And uh, several rising powers, China, but also China and Russia and Iran and, you know, many other countries that are rising powers have a different story to tell. And they say, yeah, we heard the American story and we heard the colonialist story. Great. Nice story, but you're done. We're done listening to you. And so global media, um, you know, is is trying to tell different stories. Uh, and so, you know, India has its own story and they have their own sense of the world order and their own sense of history and what the future should look like. So rising powers are trying to change the narrative and 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 they recognize that, you know, these you know, global connectivity and the contest for soft power uh, is really where, you know, the hearts and minds of, of the world are, are going to be um, changed. And, and whether the new order that is coming will, will favor, and unfortunately, this comes down to either, you know, national or cultural or ethnic there was a big article that came out around the end of the Cold War by a, an international relations scholar, same with Samuel Huntington, very influential. And and he posited that now that the Cold War was over it, and, it, and, and that the restraints on these big, you know, national and ethnic rivalries had been eliminated, that the future would, would now you know, sort of devolve into, unfortunately, <laughs> what kind of something we're, along the lines of what we're seeing now is, is that there would be, you know, a, a, a Chinese narrative, um, a European narrative, um, you know, a, a South American narrative, a South Asian narrative, that that the big divisions in the world would would, would manifest in this sort of globalized competition for, you know, the, the hearts and minds of the world. And that's kind of what's happening. I mean, anyone can tell the story now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. And like you said, it's been far too easy for one nation or, or entity to be able to gain soft power through the use of disinformation. And you know, all, all of these topics sort of uh, make you feel a little bit helpless at an individual level if you're not the one in control of uh, national security decisions. Or, but but I'd like to to think as innovators um, and CTOs and CIOs and managers um, and people who are working from the the bottom up of the innovation sphere hear this that there's some takeaways for us individually. We we like to at Untold we like to research. The concept of public intellectualism and you know how do we kind of change that concept from being a cool a list of the people who are showing up on the news circuit to uh, a concept that we can all apply to our daily actions in the world how are you promoting a, a world where knowledge is shared and um and valued and sought and the truth is sought and what's your role in that and how do you take ownership of that and so all of that to be said, I would love for us to kind of riff together at the end here about personal responsibility, truly, because so many of these forces feel out of any individual's control. And yet within our own spheres of influence, we do have some control over whether or not we allow our innovation stories to discuss the dark side and and to have that ethical touch point in our innovation processes whereby we could kill a project because of its implications to um, the betterment of society. Um, so share with us some of your thoughts on that. I think, you know, how do we as innovators prepare to say the dark side and, and, and communicate it and voice that um, in a world that does not value that? Ooh. <laughs> uh. <laughs> Yeah, Katie, uh, that's that's a big one. Uh, so 
I, I think that moral reasoning, right, the, the, the moral aspect um, of all of this does come down to the individual level. And, you know, and, and morals are passed along. And I, I really think, you know, storytelling, as you have defined it, right? But, you know, all of these concepts and all of the, you know, distinguishing between right and wrong and what should be done and what should not be done uh, do come down to individual decisions, right? Um, you know, it's, it's like I said, you know, the, the states, nation states have less control than ever before and big institutions, you know, big global entities, big concentrations of power are, are less influential now. Um, there's a dispersion of power outward and, you know, that's how this globalism really took hold. And so, I mean, if there's a good news in that is that that, that decision-making and authority and agency or whatever you want to call it has devolved down to, you know, individual, local, group level. And, and that is, that is different than, than the nation state, right? The nation states pursue what they, what they must. Um, but each of us has that, has that decision-making authority. And I would go back to the, where we started in the dual use nature of technology. Um, you know, people ask why, right? So you could say that, you know, what, what's driving all this, right? Is it the dark side? Is it the money? Is it greed? What's, what's driving all this? Why are we, why is this happening? And I used to think that, that the answer had to do with, uh, you know, necessity, right? That technology uh, and innovation unfolded when people had something that they, that they, they needed. They needed to get a task done. They, they wanted to do something. And so they needed to innovate to achieve their goal. And the more I studied it, the more I realized that, you know, a lot of this innovation comes just from, you know, why? Because because I was messing around with this. Because um, I wanted, you know, because I was curious. Because I was interested. Or, you know, I didn't plan on this. <laughs> you know, I didn't, uh, I didn't intend uh, for this to happen. You know, this was serendipitous. This you know, all just kind of came together. Um, and so I, I think what, what that means is at the individual level, uh, much of this innovation and much of the, the, the big developments, even those that are commanded and resourced and, and driven by, by larger interests, right? big Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, governments, um, you know, terrorist groups, <laughs> you know, they have their needs, mm -hmm. but it does flow to the individual to, to be, you know, this is all human. This is, I mean, I mean, we get focused on the shiny objects and we love our technology, but at the end of the day, this is all just human. And it just, it's, it's in the hands of individuals. Right, right. There, there's a moment I'll never forget when I was in college, an English professor, we were reading Holocaust literature and we put down our books and she looked up and she said, well, how does it feel to know that a Nazi scientist performing unethical exper experiments on, a, on Jewish populations went home at the end of every night and fed their family and said, hi, hun, and got in bed and wound down right. and started another day. Right. So like you said, necessity drives action and ethics become uh, more of a gray area when 
they're in contrast with our immediate needs. And that's, that's a dark, really, really dark example. But I, I think it, <laughs> it reminds you that horrors are justified or poor actions or in, irresponsible actions are justified because of that and checking ourselves individually and uh, being brave enough to say, uh, especially if you are an innovation leader, let's make sure that our stories of impact cover not only the glossy, beautiful possibilities and the stakeholder interests, but also the public health interests or the public good right. um, and the global good. Um, right, exactly. It's tough. It's tough to go against necessity, whether it's at the highest levels or in your personal uh, own personal life. What other advice do you have for innovators as someone who studies these topics constantly? Well, that's a tricky term. Uh, I find that, you know, people mean different things when they talk about innovation. And, and that, you know, if, if you're um, in business, that means one thing, right? That's a disruptive business model. Right. So we need to innovate. So, right. Uber is innovative, not because they came up with any kind of technology or they, you know, but it was, you know, the an idea. innovative business. Yeah. So that's what they yes. think of is, you know, a better way to, to, to make money or save money or um, in science, right. Innovation is either, you know, new knowledge or, you know, well, let's discover something new and a new element, uh, uh, you know, or a new process, a new way of discovering, right? You know, so when they innovate, you know, let's let's try something different. Let's experiment. Um, and, you know, of course, that means you don't know <laughs> what's going to happen. And then on the battlefield, you know, when you're talking about innovation, you're talking about a lot of times tactics and strategy. Um, and, and all of this, you know, involves the adversary or your community, right? Nothing, none of this happens, you know, without uh, the, the surrounding environment and, and you're affecting others. And so you are embedded. And whether that be in a competitive sense, you know, in the business world, uh, you know, you want to put those people out of business, <laughs> right? That's, that's what Uber, you know, with, with taxis, right? That was an institution that, that had long, long been, uh, it, you know, a part of society and, you know, it's like just wipe them out. And, and, you know, people were a little bit sad about that <laughs> <laughs> on the battlefield. It, it, a lot of times it means either new ways to, to prevail, but also I think, you know, one thing that is perhaps paradoxical, but, but positive is, is the whole notion of deterrence, right? If you get really good at, um, at fighting war, then it definitely influences the, the mindset of, of potential adversaries, right? Let's not have a war. I don't think that would work out well for us. So it's sort of the paradox of nuclear weapons, right? Mm -hmm. The ability to destroy everything turns out to be the secret to the long peace, right? Mm -hmm. when, when global competitors uh, make a rational decision that war no longer you know, can serve the purpose for which, you know, it's prosecuted, right? You can't, you can't win. We can't come out of it better than we started. Let's just not do it. Let's find a, a way to, you know, avoid uh, war. So, you know, I find this notion of innovation really elusive, very evasive, and, and, uh, and something that is, natural uh it's a natural outcome of curiosity of necessity of creativity um it's a part of human nature right it it's it's a it's a part of what we do to survive and so i i'm often kind of perplexed by by prescriptions you know how to innovate and how yes. to create it an, an innovative workplace, you know, how to foster innovation, you know, how to tease it out of people. Come on, come yeah. on, you can do it. Let's innovate. 
think, to, you know, out of the box, let's try, you know, I, I just think it's a very hard thing to, to capture and yeah. impose. It seems to me like more, you know, more of a unicorn um, and something that, that, that occurs naturally and will always occur and, and not always, you know, you can't repress it either. Right. You, you don't want terrorists to be innovative um, in, you know, I mean, one of the best case studies of innovation in war is the IED. Right. Mm. And that is a very low tech, you know, uh, you know, and, and, and it was something that, that a number of terrorists around the world uh, came upon as a way to deal with the overwhelming conventional military power that, you know, they wanted to disrupt and they mm -hmm. wanted to defeat. And so, you know, that's terrorists are really good at innovation. <laughs> necessity. <laughs> once again, necessity. Yeah. Goodness. Thank you. I, I know we could keep going and we've, we've talked for an hour. I can't believe it. It just flew by to me. <laughs> I'm sure listeners feel that way as well. Um, Zach, I'm so grateful to have had you on the podcast talking about all of these issues. And I agree with you. We need to con continue to fight for nuance in our understandings of innovation. <laughs> and um, where can where can listeners find you? Well, we've got a, a, a website at the Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory has a little think tank uh, where I work. And that's the Center for Global Security Research, CGSR. So it's cgsr.llnl.gov, and we have a lot of publications on various topics, uh, people who cover, you know, various uh, issues. We're working on a big um, biosecurity pro project right now and also working on a big uh, climate and environment uh, and security project. We've got lots of publications and lots of interesting um lectures that that you can click on and and learn something from so um i'm i'm reachable through there wonderful thank you so much zach davis for being on the podcast and for joining us today we'll talk to you soon thank you katie thanks for letting me ramble thanks for listening to this week's episode be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation you can find us at untold content